Thanks, Justin. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with, with so many people whose work I really admire and uh, um, opportunities to collaborate and do great things, bringing engineering and psychiatry together, hopefully. I'm going to mostly tell you stories because it's after lunch and I'm competing with your parasympathetic nervous system <laughs> rest and digest response. And my story, uh, actually, first, um, the disclosures, as he said, um, I've co-founded two companies, Empatica and Affective, and I'm a shareholder of both of those. And I'm not going to talk about the technology of Affectiva today. You saw a lot of face reading work yesterday, and Affectiva is in that space. Uh, but I will be mentioning some of the sensors we're developing at Empatica. Um, but mostly I'm focused on the science today. Okay, so my first story starts when my students and I were in uh, the midst of a lot of work with people on the autism spectrum. And the literature told us that they had difficulty reading other people's emotions. And sometimes they definitely have difficulty reading other people's emotions and communicating their understanding. Uh, but one day one of them pulls me aside and she says, after we built all this technology to read facial expressions and help people on the spectrum process with a small camera what was going on on the face of the person across from them, um, she pulls me aside and she says, Roz, you've got it all wrong. Humbling. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what have I got completely wrong? Uh, she says, the biggest problem I have is not reading other people's emotions. The biggest problem I have is you're not reading my emotions properly. And I thought, great, you know, I work in this and I'm doing that bad of a job. Uh, what is it I'm not reading properly? And she says, it's not just you, a moment of hope. <laughs> um, it's everybody is not reading my emotions properly. So what are we not reading properly? You're not reading the enormous stress and anxiety that I'm experiencing. And I realized that what we were often seeing outwardly, while this little boy looks anxious and stressed, uh, it was a person who looked like they were pretty chill, sometimes even detached, sometimes looking completely lazy, laying on the floor, looking disconnected from the world. And it, once we got to where we could start to um, measure what was going on inside them, we realized they were in, in the entirely opposite state of what we were judging them as. And this fits many things we'd heard from parents who would say their kids seemed to have a meltdown that came from nowhere. He looked perfectly chill, and next thing you know, he was injurious to himself and others, got kicked out of school, and this repeated, and he's on his fourth school. And please, Professor Picard, could you do something to help us with this? So we started realizing that in the lab where we had been trying to measure emotion for a long time, and I could talk for hours about the ways we've been doing that, uh, one of the things we'd been measuring was autonomic nervous system responses and the fight or flight response, super oversimplified description of it, uh, but the sympathetic nervous system response uh, innervates the skin and that is, uh, in fact, the skin we believe is purely innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, unlike the heart, which gets sympathetic and parasympathetic. So by measuring uh, the skin response, we might be able to get more of the sympathetic fight or flight that might possibly precede some of these self-injurious events or meltdowns. Uh, we also have been interested in the parasympathetic response, not just to compete with it after lunch and talks like this, uh, but to understand what is calming for people and works against that sympathetic. So to measure the sympathetic, we went back to a signal that's been studied for more than 100 years. It used to be called the galvanic skin response. There's been a lot of kind of bad science around it. So, you know, we were looking at, can we measure this in a quality way? Usually it's measured on the palm, across the fingers with wires. And it's, you know, you think of it as, hey, you get stressed, your palms get sweaty, the electrical conductance goes up. And that's true. But it turns out that it also goes up even when you don't feel sweaty on the surface of your palms, uh, with a whole lot of other interesting events. And it also turns out, we're going to find, that it's not just a generalized uh, anxiety response like we originally thought. Uh, we started building versions of this that could leave the lab, as was talked about a lot yesterday, the ideal psychiatric lab of the future is the real world, and we wanted to build the lab that went on the person uh, instead of having to bring the person to the lab, especially important in conditions like autism, where people can describe weird things like their perception going entirely blank in a stressful new environment. Uh, so we built lots of different places to wear this. Um, 
palms, wrists, ankles, a lot of kind of funny stories, accidentally discovering that it worked where it wasn't supposed to work. And then uh, this has been commercialized multiple times. Here is uh, two sensors that measure electrodermal activity today, the Embrace on the top and the E4 on the bottom. I happen to be recording myself live uh, with both of them right now. I'll say a little bit more about these. The uh, E4 measures the uh, both, it's designed to capture both the sympathetic and parasympathetic main signals and has been on the market used by researchers for a couple years now. Uh, in addition to the autonomic data, it gives you three-axis accelerometer raw data, raw temperature data through an optical sensor going just under the surface of the skin, a uh, two-LED version of the photoplethysmograph that gives you the blood volume pulse for heart rate and heart rate variability estimates, and skin conductance. The raw data, when you're streaming it to a mobile device, uh, looks like this. And you see the electrodermal at the top goes up with more conductance. And the blood volume pulse is noisy there on the left when you're moving, but as you hold still, it starts to look nice and periodic. And you can even see the dichrotic notch in there and start to get uh, estimates of not just heart rate, but heart rate variability and more when a person's nice and still. Uh, and also you can read the temperature just under the surface of the skin and accelerometer activity. Uh, we're usually asked how good is it for heart rate variability. Uh, in a comparison that was made by Empatica to a predecessor to the E4 called the E3, they, uh, when people were under still conditions with a much more expensive biopack ECG system here, oversampling the data, uh, all of these parameters people are usually interested in for heart rate variability were measured. Uh, and error peak by peak was measured. And overall, it's about 2% error compared to a gold standard electrocardiogram based, much more expensive system. Uh, now that's under still conditions. When there's movement artifacts, you will not get such nice results. But what I wanna talk about in the rest of my stories here is what happened uh, that allowed us to start to find some very surprising things that we did not expect to find about the sympathetic response when measured from the skin. And so I'm gonna focus on the left side of this uh, from here on out and combine it with some other things. Now, this is a, a few, it's a minute or so of, it, this is a 45 minute occupational therapy session here with a girl who has an autism diagnosis. She has limited ability to communicate verbally, so she's getting very stressed here because she can't communicate what she wants to happen, we think. And uh, what we see here is one minute of data, the right edge is uh, right now, and she's about to have a meltdown, which we see here. Meltdown, ah, uh, all right. I think the sound is turned off there, and that may be for the best. This one minute wide uh, swath corresponds to this little blue window right here. And you can see that her electrodermal activity has been growing here for several minutes, uh, about 10 minutes before this peak. We um, don't see her wearing anything on her wrists here. That's because the sense she was very distracted by things on her wrists, so she's wearing the two sensors on her ankles. You may see black sweatbands on her ankles there when she hops in here. And we also see when she gets in the ball pit and starts getting um, a more certain situation, more control, more, more deep pressure on her body, that she starts to chill and the signal goes down and we start to see her relax. Uh, for each child, we could use this data and start to read out what was making their response go up, what was making their response go down, and what was consistent or not consistent about that, uh, both within a child over time and across children. Here's a later moment for the same child getting on a swing. Uh, we see another peak here, very different from the first one. The first one was associated with a meltdown. This one is associated with the moment of getting on the swing. Many things can make the signal go up. Uh, certainly being in a hot human room can make it go up and so we measure temperature. Um, physical activity can make it go up so we measure activity. Uh, motor coordination, especially if it's hard, cognitive load, motor planning for a person who has to think to wiggle their toes can make it go up. You can see them not moving, but they tell you they're trying to move and the signal will go up. Uh, also, emotional excitement and stress, of course, can make it go up. So here we don't know what made it go up when she got on the swing because all of those things could have been involved. But as she swings, uh, we see a nice decaying exponential. 
Uh, now, another example of this uh, that I think may relate to your practices, those of you who are in the clinic, happened when uh, we didn't have a version, you could see it live here, but a person was logging the data. It was a young woman on the autism spectrum, and she came to me, and she said, you know, I'm giving a three-minute speech tonight, and I'm really stressed. Can I borrow one of your sensors? I want to see if I can see my stress. And I said, sure. And so she takes the sensor, and uh, the event was supposed to start at 8, but shortly before they announced it was going to be delayed. Now, as you may know, uncertainty increases stress, and for a person on the autism spectrum, uh, it can really increase stress. So she responded by pacing, walking back and forth. Now, her male friend who was sitting nearby, agitated by her pacing, says, stop pacing, that doesn't help you. Uh, he couldn't see the data. And so she stops pacing, <laughs> and she starts stimming. And I asked her, what do you mean stimming? And she said it was kind of a flapping, rocking kind of a thing while standing. Uh, so she stims, then the event starts, and her signal drops. Uh, then is her three-minute talk, which would be the peak, except that there were, you know, when the microphone gives that feedback squelching, and she has sensory issues. So we see some feed, you know, some other peaks here with that are, we think are what that was. Um, three minute talk, otherwise is the biggest peak, and then it's downhill from there. Now after the event, she wants to look at her data. She comes back, put it on the computer, and her male friend is there, and she's like, yeah, I'll show it to you too. And they look at the timestamp, and the first words spoken were by him. And he said, I'm not gonna tell you to stop pacing anymore. And the next morning, I saw the two of them before another event, and this time, she was pacing, and this time, he was ignoring her happily typing on his laptop. So we saw a behavior change that, in this case, we think might have been enhanced by seeing some objective data. Now, I've seen this story in a lot of different forms, where people, like, don't really believe it, but their body or something's telling them that something's stressing or calming, and when they get the data, then they're more likely to believe it. Now, that can be good or bad, uh, but in general, if it's done properly, it it's, can be very good. Now, the first time that I saw these uh, data from a wristband that logged electrodermal activity 24-7 uh, is the data shown right here. Let me show you what you're looking at here. This is seven days of data. Uh, this was a college student wearing it on the wrist, and he's wearing it, he or she is wearing it for 24 hours. I stay blind to identity here. Uh, and what we see is, um, for each day, uh, some annotations from the student. And we see that the student annotated the studying, the exam, the end of this lab session, MIT homework, notoriously hard. We know cognitive load, mental load, emotional stress. These make the skin conductance go up. When you are really engaged in solving a problem uh, or trying to prepare or think or act in some uh, important way, skin conductance goes up, uh, which is uh, unfortunately to the embarrassment of we MIT professors, the low point every day over here is um, classroom activity. Very humbling. Uh, if I can get you to laugh or ask a question or interact or think of something active, your skin conductance goes up as an audience. We've measured audiences uh, by mapping skin conductance to brightness of an LED. Unfortunately, we've also seen uh, audiences in a dark auditorium with the LED mapped to skin conductance getting very bright when there's a new speaker, when there's a live demo, when there's laughter, um, and a, that decaying exponential when there's extended PowerPoint. We've, now, you might be puzzled if you see this stuff labeled sleep here in the middle, and look at this, like, in the, each day is normalized within itself here, and look how big that peak is during sleep. The biggest peak of every day is usually during sleep. Now, that, you should be scratching your head and going, huh? Like, didn't she just say this goes up with cognitive load, mental, physical, emotional activation? Why doesn't sleep look more like classroom activity? here, right? Like, it, now, sleep does, at the start, look like classroom activity, and very flat. Uh, but what we see quickly is these huge peaks, and if you zoom in on these, they have high-frequency um, skin conductance responses that have all kinds of interesting characteristics I can go into in a longer talk. Uh, but one tantalizing study, which I, I um, will 
suggest to you, but we need to do a lot more. I'd like to see this replicated. This was just 24 healthy adults, 72 nights of sleep with uh, Bob Stickgold and crew at Beth Israel. Uh, and what we did is we had people do Bob's memory consolidation protocol where they learn something new, they sleep, and then they're tested on it in the morning or, or after the sleep period. And you look at whether they improved or got worse. And here we took the top 20% who improved on the, video disc the visual discrimination task, or the bottom 20%. And we just asked, is there any difference in the people who did best after sleep versus who did worse after sleep with the skin conductance measure compared to uh, the measures Bob said were most associated with memory consolidation, which were from polysomnography, um, the stage one, stage two, stage three, REM, uh, REM sleep, stage, four, uh, stage three now, deep sleep, and having more uh, deep sleep earlier in the night and more REM later was associated with better memory consolidation. So we took his polysomnography sleep staging uh, features, we took accelerometer data, we took electrodermal activity data, we took a whole bunch of channels of EEG data, and then we took various combinations of those, and we subjected them to six different machine learning algorithms and a simple binary classifier of could they tell who did best versus who did worst. And none of these models does perfectly at this, but surprisingly, the red one is usually doing best, and in one case, the purple one. Uh, I never just use one model here, we've got six. And there's a real consistent effect of the red one doing best. And that turns out to be the electrodermal activity, which is kind of surprising, right? Why would a little sweat response on a wrist have anything at all to do with somebody, whether they're learning well uh, after sleep or not? Now, at first I thought this was totally lame, uh, but some other things I'm going to share with you in a moment I think will help you see that there's actually potentially something very interesting going on here. All right, the next story is the one that took me in a totally different direction. This is the sweat band, one of my favorites, Domo, uh, that had skin conductance and accelerometer sensing in it and could log the data 24-7. And it was right before the end of uh, fall semester, right before winter break, when an uh, undergrad student knocks on my door and he said to me, um, Professor Picard, could I please borrow one of your sensors? My little brother has autism, he can't talk, and I want to see what's stressing him out. And I said, okay, um, in fact, you know, these things break a lot back then, they were hand-built, so I said, don't just take one, take two. Uh, yeah, I recommend you use one, let it break, and then use a second. He's like, I said, do you need a soldering iron? He's like, I got a soldering iron, great, MIT student, I'll be all set. Uh, so he puts the two on at the same time for his little brother. Okay, disobey me, fine. Um, I'm really glad he did, let me tell you why. I'm back in my office looking at the data and the little boy had very low responses in the beginning, first day looks pretty chill, next day pretty chill, next day pretty chill, and I'm kind of yawning thinking, here's a kid with severe autism and he's having a really, you know, really relaxing time. Um, or he just runs a low signal, which can certainly happen with ADHD and some other conditions. And then I go to the next day, and my jaw drops. Uh, one of his wrist signals went so high that I thought the sensor must be broken. Now, we have stressed people out at MIT every way we can think of, trying to find out the maximum range of the signal. Uh, we have done qualifying exams. We have done loud balloons popping in your ear. We have done Boston driver experiments. <laughs> and I had never seen a peak this big. And the weirder thing was, it was happening on one side and not the other. And when I zoomed in, the other side wasn't even having, I convinced myself a little noise blip might be something, but I knew it was a noise blip. Uh, and furthermore, the data right before and right after looked like it was working fine for both sensors. In fact, there was a clear sleep signature and sleep peaks afterwards. So I did a bunch of debugging. I'm an electrical engineer by training, and I could not figure out what was causing it. So I screwed up my courage and called a student at home on vacation. <laughs> Hi, uh, how's your vacation? How's your little brother? Uh, hey, any idea what happened to him? And I gave him the exact date and time in the uh, log. And he says, I don't know. I'll check the diary. Diary? Like, MIT student keeps a diary, you know, like moment of, you know, quick prayer, like, really, I have teenage sons now, like, none of them would ever write this down. 
he comes back, he has the exact date and time, and he tells me that was right before he had a grand mal seizure. Now, I didn't know hardly anything about seizures. I uh, Some stuff that was wrong that I'd been told as a kid, so I quickly did some research. And then I wound up calling Dr. Joe Madsen over here at Children's Hospital Boston, dad of another student. Hi, Dr. Madsen, my name is Rosalind Picard. Is it possible that a person with epilepsy could have a huge sympathetic nervous system surge? Uh, in this case, it looked like it was 20 minutes before the seizure. So I said 20 minutes before a seizure. And he said, um, probably not. But it's interesting, he said, we've had patients whose hair stands on end on one arm 20 minutes before a seizure. And I'm like, on one arm? I didn't want to tell him originally it was on one side because I thought that was just too weird. And he thought that was super interesting. In fact, uh, explain how different regions of the brain could map to lateralized responses. So he got very interested. We built a bunch more sensors, got them safety certified. Uh, he was running a protocol with 90 families uh, for kids who were uh, candidates for brain surgery. So they're around the clock in the epilepsy monitoring unit having video EEG, electrocardiogram, and now EDA, electrodermal activity, so we could see if there was anything at all happening here related to these seizures. And we found that for, uh, we did not find prediction like we thought. We hoped to find that. Um, we're not, I'm not making any prediction claims today, although that's an area of active research. Uh, but we did find when we had the gold standard time synchronized EEG, and EDA uh, that 100% of the grand mal seizures had a significant, more than two standard deviations above the pre-seizure period uh, response. And here, remember how I said the sleep was usually the biggest peak of the day? Well, here's 24 hours uh, for a teenager, and here's his sleep, and this would usually be the biggest peak of the day. And usually all the stuff we monitor related to stress is down here in the ground cover, while these three kind of giant redwood trees are, are poking out here uh, the seizures themselves are only a few minutes long, about as wide as these skinny red lines, but the skin conductance response is enduring for 10, 20, 30 minutes longer in some cases. And we thought, wow, uh, why? Like, I mean, I could see if somebody's convulsing, and here this person's convulsing, you can see it with the accelerometer data right below it. Uh, and by the way, um, Ming Po did an awesome job on this and built the first machine learning model using these two signals to give a more sensitive and specific seizure detector here. And since then, Empatica has commercialized this and improved upon it, um, and some recent work just published uh, shows the latest results there, and has gotten it cleared medically in Europe, and it's in the process of going through clearance in the US right now for a seizure detector. So it's um, more accurate, um, but okay, so we can detect seizures, but what is all this response. Is it somebody just convulsing and getting sweaty? Uh, you know, I'm the engineer who always wants to understand why something's happening. Uh, is it noise? Is it signal? What does it mean? So I wanted to figure out what this meant. And I learned about something I didn't know about in the process that I want to share with you. I'm curious how many people here uh, know, before I put this slide up, what SUDEP was. I should have asked you to raise your hand before. All right. You should look around because there's only a few hands and this is a super brilliant, highly educated, amazing audience um, and it's a tragedy that uh, we don't all know this. Um, so we're going to change that right now. Uh, in the past, doctors mostly didn't talk about this because they didn't think much could be done about it, but in the last couple of years there's been a lot of research showing that we could probably take this red bar and drive it down quite significantly. Uh, the, horizontal, the vertical axis is years of potential life lost. So a measure of number of deaths times years remaining. And we see that SUDEP is number two on causing the most years of potential life loss of all neurological disorders, number two after stroke. Uh, and furthermore, we've been learning, we think it doesn't have to be that high. Now what is it? SUDEP is when a person has an epilepsy diagnosis and they're found dead and you can't attribute it to hitting their head, drowning, a heart attack, or any other causes. Uh, just. Uh, and you don't even know if they had a seizure right then. You just know they have epilepsy and they're found dead. And they're almost always found alone when this happens. One of the things that happened when patients were found as victims of SUDEP in the hospital, okay, they're in the epilepsy monitoring unit, they're hooked up with an EEG, nobody knew they were having a seizure and checked on them quickly and they, lo and behold, go to check on them and they're dead. Uh, when they go back and they look at the EEG preceding that, 
then they always have seen that each EEG channel here has gone from going kind of crazy on the scalp, uh, showing signs of this epileptiform activity, to going flat. Now, ideally, it would go back to normal activity, but this flattening, um, which is called postictal generalized EEG suppression, postictal because it's post the seizure, generalized because it's across all the EEG channels, suppression being defined below 10 microvolts. Um, this flattening uh, hopefully goes back to normal brain activity, and it does in most cases, um, but in SUDEPs it does not. It stays flat. Now, what is causing this? And so that was another mystery. Well, we found when we were trying to figure out why the wrist signal is getting so big when the seizure appears to have stopped in particular, uh, we learned that the bigger the response on the wrist, the more there was of this flattening, the longer the flattening. Now, let's think a moment here. Like, huh, what's going on here, right? Looks like the brain's going dead, flat, and we're getting a bigger response on the wrist? You know, explain this to me. Well, it turns out, you guys probably know this, but I didn't, um, the EEG on the scalp can pick up uh, electrical activity near the scalp, right, the cortex, but it doesn't necessarily, in fact, it doesn't pick up all the activity deeper in the brain. And the key regions we're measuring for emotion, you know, like the hippocampus, amygdala, they're pretty deep in there. And there can be a seizure, huge unusual electrical activity deep in one of those regions, and it doesn't even show up on the scalp. There can be seizures deep in your brain that do not show up electrographically on the surface as seizures. Uh, moreover, some activity deep in the brain that doesn't show up as anything on the scalp, in fact, the scalp looks flat, act like no activity, um, can cause an unusually large skin conductance response. So here was our first data from children's, uh, with a, sort of a small n, showing a significant correlation published in neurology. And since then, that's been replicated uh, in a larger population, including also adults. And unfortunately, now we also have a suit up case that takes the graph um, way up, too, with uh, infinite duration PGS and the largest EDA um, amplitude that we've ever seen. All right, now I said you all need to know about SUDEP because now people can do something about it and patients want to be told about it. Uh, and you probably have friends who have epilepsy who may not have even told you they have epilepsy uh, who also need to be told about it because you might save a life this way. Uh, there are more people dying in the United States every year from SUDEP than from house fires. Most coroners don't even report SUDEPs, don't even have a code and don't know about it, so they believe now that those numbers of more than house fires are super conservative. It's probably way, way, way more than house fires. There's at least one every seven to nine minutes using the conservative numbers, so it's probably much more frequent. And it's also known that um, SUDEP is much more likely when the person's alone. Now, why would, why would having somebody there make any difference? What is the mechanism? Now, the mechanism is still a bit of a mystery. Um, but I'm going to give you a couple more stories and then relate it back to um, mood and stress and things I think the psychiatry community is interested in. Uh, so what we do know is that if people get there, the person seems to be more likely to live. So alerting to this might help save lives. So unusual brain activity is kind of like a little brush fire in your brain. And you wouldn't think of building a house without a smoke detector. So we said, how come people aren't building the equivalent of that for these little brain fires? Uh, so we decided we needed to build one, and we needed to understand and help people understand more of these mechanisms that might lead to SUDEP prevention. Uh, now, there is not a fully explained uh, phenomenon, not a full explanation for the phenomenon yet, but there's some intriguing bits that have been published recently. And here's one super cool piece of work published um, summer of 2015, where they found when they went in and directly stimulated the amygdala in patients with and without epilepsy, so you've got a craniotomy, you go in, you stimulate it, that the person, like Justin, could be sitting there reading his email, volunteering for the craniotomy, probably not, um, go in, stimulate his amygdala, and he stops breathing, but he shows no outward signs of distress. Ex distress. It's like something just shocked him and he took, and took his breath away for a moment, like a wow experience but nothing turns his breathing back on until I say, hey, Justin, and he says, huh, and takes a breath. No signs of distress. And they, they showed this in multiple people when you stimulate the amygdala directly or when you waited and watched a seizure come over and stimulate the amygdala. Turns off your breathing, doesn't turn it back on. But a person, stimulation, external, could turn it back on. Separate work 
it's been shown when you go in and stimulate the left and right amygdala that you get a ipsilateral, same side, left amygdala, left skin conductance response here on the palm, right amygdala stimulation, right skin conductance response. This was the work of Mangina and Bouchard and Mangina uh, in epilepsy patients who were off their AEDs and not having seizures at the time. So this suggested that if something's in there super stimulating that amygdala, possibly turning off your breathing, we should see it on the wrist, even if it may not show up uh, on EEG. So we started um, trying to build uh, sensors that would get out of the lab, and, um, and I see Rich Fletcher, who should raise his hand, sitting there, who is instrumental in helping build one of the first versions of these, and on kids with autism, and then in kids um, and adults in epilepsy monitoring units uh, here in the Longwood area. And this led us to realize we needed to stop just collecting data for our science with devices like this and give patients a version that could run machine learning real time on board, also tell time so when people ask them what that is they're wearing, they could check the time and show them it does something besides a stig stigmatizing disorder uh, and also be waterproof and all those good things uh, and look nice. It's actually won design prizes. So this is the Embrace smartwatch that tells time, monitors steps, uh, gives you sleep-wake data, gives a whole lot of other cool sleep-wake parameters for we sleep geeks who like to know a lot of that other stuff in the signal. Um, gives temperature, time, and in Europe, uh, can, we can claim seizure detection right now, and we're working on those claims in the U.S. with FDA right now. Uh, and we're, I've been testing um, apps related to stress uh, and a lot of other things, and Patica does a lot of custom work. Here's just an example of what you see today on the Mate Diary app. You can get a picture of your sleep, of your physical activity, of convulsive seizures. It also has a seizure diary in there, and Empatica's adding some other diary custom stuff for different people. Um, can do ecological momentary assessment if you want, things like that to combine patient input data with data passively sensed. Now, what makes my skin conductance go up these days is uh, getting emails like this. Here's one I got uh, from an early customer using Embrace with her daughter. She told me that she was in the shower. She saw her phone on the counter go off and tell her that her daughter uh, needed her help. She goes running out of the shower to her daughter's bedroom, finds her daughter face down in bed blue, not breathing, flips her daughter over, and her daughter turns pink, takes a, takes a breath, turns pink, takes more breaths, more breaths, turns pink, um, multiple breaths, then pink, and I was stressed reading this, uh, and then her daughter was fine, and her daughter's been fine. I'm freaking out reading this. <laughs> My skin conductance is going through the roof. Like, you know, don't trust this. What if the battery breaks? What if the Bluetooth connection breaks? What if, what if? And she's like, it's okay. I know that uh, no technology is perfect, uh, but I'm so grateful this got me there in time. Since then, uh, we are he hearing lots of stories of people who, um, adults, children, others, who once they learn that there's a risk of not breathing after seizures, in particular after uh, grand mal, also officially called generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and also what used to be called complex partial seizures, seizures that don't have convulsions but can take your breath away. There's a much smaller risk. Um, the best way to prevent SUDEP is to keep people on their meds, um, not have seizures. Uh, the, um, and obviously this isn't going to, no device is going to prevent suit up here. Um, but we hope by communicating this, you talking to your friends, people letting people know they should not be alone when they have a seizure, and if they're at risk of suit up, learning about it so that they can take steps to prevent their seizures from happening, uh, then hopefully together we can all help save more lives with uh, this finding that started as a what looked like a piece of noise in the lab. Now, since... Starting off trying to measure stress outside the lab and accidentally discovering that unusual brain activity was leading to patterns of electrical activation on our body in different places, I was puzzling over this in front of a group of doctors at one point, and I said, you know, why would this be? Like, why would something deep in the brain not show up on a scalp EEG, but show up on a, you know, a wrist conductance measure? I mean, this is weird. I'm really glad I had tenure when I found this because I wouldn't have believed it myself. And this doctor says to me, oh, Roz, it's easy. It's Medicine 101. I'm like, I'm an engineer. I haven't had Medicine 101. It's kind of embarrassing. All of you have probably had Medicine, you know, 909. <laughs> you know, you've had it all, right? Well, I 
said, so what is it? She goes, well, it's trivial. We were all born, when we were all embryos, we all had three kinds of tissue. And all of you who have medical training know this. Uh, and the ectoderm, one of the three kinds of tissue, knit together our skin and our spinal cord and these deep regions of the brain, our whole neural structure from the moment we were formed. So it's no surprise that when you go in and you stimulate one region of the brain, you get a skin conductance pattern in one place. And you stimulate another region, and you get a skin conductance pattern in another place. And a great basic science question that needs to be solved now is how specific are these? What more could we be learning by measuring the skin and working with dermatologists and others who know that these internal states map out here uh, and taking this seriously and starting to see what these patterns are? It also tells us that there's a lot of findings from brain imaging that we can now use to make predictions for what we might find in skin conductance. For example, uh, there's studies showing in strong right-handers that you expect the right amygdala to be activated more with threat stimuli and the left one with a mix of positive and negative. So I went back through some of our data where we happened to have two sides that, where we'd only been looking at one side and ignored the other side. For example, my students and I had done a lot of these classic stress experiments where you bring people in, you got to count from 4,000 backwards by sevens. And to make it a little harder we, or a little more stressful, we put a person behind you uh, and you're at MIT where you feel everybody should be able to subtract, right? We're all educated. We should be able to do this. The person behind you has this obnoxious buzzer and they're going to hit it if you don't go fast enough or you make a mistake, right? So, you, so it makes your palms sweat. Um, and it turns out it doesn't just make your palms sweat. Uh, usually people just measure the left palm and they say, yeah, it goes up like this. There's 25 people and it's going up a bunch for these people. It's funny, it's not going up that much for these people. They must not have gotten stressed by this task. It's what they would usually conclude because usually you just measure the left side. And I said, okay, we had the right data for that too. Let's go back and look at that. It should look the same as the left data, right? 100 years of the literature has said you don't have to measure both sides, just measure uh, the left side. I said, but wait a minute, with these new findings and the right amygdala should be more activated in this response, I predict we're going to have more right skin conductance. So what did we get? We get a whopper more right skin conductance for some people. In fact, some people, not only is their right skin conductance going through the roof, but their left side almost looks suppressed. Uh, we replicated this in um, some additional populations. This was on the wrist, by the way, uh, not on the palm, although the original brain stuff was on the palm. And so now we're super interested, like why sometimes does one side go up more than the left? Could that be this mapping? Now, we can't just say it's the amygdala because we know there's several subcortical regions that map ipsilaterally. There's also motor that maps contralaterally and there's some cortical that map bilaterally. So it's not that simple. Uh, but we do know now that in these kinds of studies, we want to look at both sides. You can come to completely the wrong conclusions if you follow the uh, instructions that have been in the literature for the last hundred years. We can also look longitudinally at individuals and see what in their life is making one side go above the other. Uh, and this is a lot of fun. Uh, and for some of us, it definitely corresponds to this threat fear stuff. Routine meetings, except for when you're kind of embarrassed being late, you're, um, you know, the two sides stay the same, running late to something, threat, uh-oh, what if I'm going to be late? Right can pop up above left, but once you're on the road, they go down. Here, Here's the beginning of a meeting with people who could determine the next five years direction of somebody's funding and other important stuff. Uh, right goes way above left. Meeting ends, the two go right back together. Um, and then the rest of the night, sort of happy, normal, back and forth. This is not explained by motor activity in this case and it's not explained by temperature changes. Uh, if you're interested in this, there's a paper published on this recently in um, Emotion Review that goes through all this. There's also commentary. The editor called me up and said, you know, this can be a little controversial. You're kind of saying that 100 years of ways of doing it might be missing something. And so we brought on, I, he said, are you open to commentary? And I said, yes, of course, bring it on. If, I'm, if we're wrong, please let us know quickly. <laughs> Let's get it over with. Um, so we got a lot of commentary. And actually, it was fascinating, including um, cardiologists pointing out, we're not surprised at all by this. We know that there's this sympathetic asymmetry in cardiology. And it's a very fascinating phenomenon to look at interacting with heart disease, too, and stress. And those pathways could be very important for some other research studies. We're also learning that it may matter where the electrodes are, not just uh, if it's on the left or the right, but 
it's not just a left-right body thing. We can have different patterns um, on the palms, the wrists, the legs. It does not, it's not simply the case that everything on the right side of your body goes higher than everything on the left. So somebody needs to do some very careful work uh, to map these out much more precisely. So this brings me to my last story. I have about five minutes here. Um, what my former boss always asked for, and he, before we accidentally found the seizures and all, and I was just teaching robots how to recognize our emotions. He said to me, Roz, when are you going to do something useful? He said, I need, I need a mood ring that tells me my wife's mood before I go home. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, you know, and, but then might she expect you to do more? You know, this could change the whole dynamic. Well, so anyhow, I didn't work on it. Uh, but recently, we started learning a lot more about mood, and I know you guys are the super experts on this, so I will put this up really fast. I know Matt Knox said yesterday suicide rates haven't changed significantly over the decades, um, but these recent numbers actually are looking at not just suicide rates, but suicide and depression. And the one that really struck me is, well, several of these, but not just one suicide every 20 seconds by the year 2020. And these are forecasts. Hopefully they'll be wrong. Uh, hopefully it won't be this bad. But by 2030, uh, the numbers worldwide from the World Health Organization are forecasting that depression will be the number one disease burden globally. All right, disability and lives lost will be greater than cancer, accidents, war, and stroke. All right, let's, let's think about that. Greater than cancer, greater than war, greater than accidents, and stroke. Uh, so we'd like to see if we could do something different there. And usually I show you real data. This is a concept diagram where we've taken hundreds of things and rolled them up. And let's say that your well-being is great, and this is time, and you've just been hired into your dream job and you go into it and your well-being goes up, everything's great. Uh, or we've admitted students to MIT and they're living out their dreams, it's wonderful. Um, of course, major stressors set in and everybody takes a dive. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in top universities and top companies, uh, something like you know 30% of people are taking this path, right? And then hopefully somewhere in here they're getting help from the medical system, from professionals like the experts here, uh, or they're bouncing back um, even better, being resilient, um, or making their way back up here. And, but what we'd like to do is find out what if we could do something to tell back here if people are on the red line or the blue line before they get in trouble, and before those well-being measures actually significantly drop. And if we could tell back here, what if we could do something back here to move people from the red line to the blue line uh, before it gets bad? And what if, in doing that, we could prevent most of depression? So this is speculation. We have not shown this. Uh, this is kind of a crazy dream. Well, we are now, uh, I'm so excited to be in partnership here with, with many of you, um, uh, folks like, uh, you know, like Matt Nock, looking at, people who are down here now with wearable and mobile measures and getting the data to try to understand what is changing here when a person's doing better or if we're not helping them do better. Um, are, can we get objective measures that show us how to make better decisions to help people here? We're also in the middle of this curve here, working um, in several partnerships with Mass General Hospital uh, with Albert Young and people undergoing Tai Chi with mild depression, uh, with David Paolo and Esther here on people with moderate depression and um, people with severe depression with John Camperdon uh, treated with transcranial magnetic stimulation, gathering data and trying to understand and bring the tools of engineering and objective data, many of the cool things you saw yesterday, um, to understand clinically what we could do differently. Now, most of this is still work in progress. I have one result that we just presented last week, uh, made public at the Affective computing conferences is more of a kind of methodology looking at measuring passive data from uh, two E4 wearable sensors on both sides and smartphone data. Uh, we were getting um, direct input from people, but here all the prediction is done only based on the passive data uh, where they don't have to actively put stuff in, although we use some data they put in to help train up the models. So training the models on some data, testing it on other data, uh, we're finding that we can predict uh, or estimate the Hamilton depression rating score uh, with an error of less than two points, where I think the maximum is a 52 here, so out of 52 point range. 
and a 0.97 Pearson correlation on that right now. This is with only 22 people right now, so clearly we need to do a bigger group, only eight weeks. There's no forecasting here like we want to do, um, but it's exciting to see that there's actually information in these data, in the passive data, that might be helpful. Our passion right now is to try to uh, do the forecasting for the college students, and here, uh, just like yesterday, you saw people presenting tons of features. They could measure really cool stuff out there to do that these days. Sleep, wake, physical activity, light exposure, autonomic stress, texting, social network, phone calls, the shape of people's network, geolocation patterns. We get all of that stuff with our mobile phone monitoring. We've been getting it in hundreds of college students with a nice study joint with uh, Chuck Seisler and Beth Clerman and team at Brigham Women's Hospital. And here our goal is not just to detect your state right now, but to forecast tomorrow night. It's very hard. There's a lot of data challenges. I won't go into here, but we just presented some work last week, uh, if you're interested, showing how to do a better job of addressing missing data uh, using a multimodal autoencoder method. So when a patient's sensor or phone bugs out on you for a day or two, uh, that can be informative, right? It could be a sign they're doing worse, could be a sign they're actually doing better, or that something's just broken. How do we deal with that data. So we've been working on that. But the really cool, mind-blowing thing for me was, was this little piece of finding here. Uh, using deep neural networks um, that are trained in a very different way, uh, more personalized multitasking methods, where we're using some data across the population and some data for each person in their past, and we're trying to forecast tomorrow night, are you going to be high stress, low stress, are you going to be in a positive mood or a negative mood and sort of a core affect way? Or are you going to be physically healthy or unhealthy? So we're binarizing those three problems. We're training up machine learning on them, and we're giving you a personalized forecast. Uh, we're setting up the problem so it would be 50-50, would be a random guess for the mood forecast for tomorrow night or stress forecast. What do you think we're getting? I thought maybe it would be 55, 60, but we're already at 78 to 87%. Um, forecasting tomorrow night's uh, stress, mood, and physical health. So this is suggesting that we can do a lot with this. I just want to, um, I'm running out of time, so I just want to give a quick point here. Personalization matters. We find, we don't just want to tell you tomorrow night you're going to be more stressed, you're going to be in a worse mood. We want to actually give you personalized feedback, how to do something about it. And what we're learning is that it matters who you are. Some people, for example, their social activity can really improve their mood. Other people, their social activity can really worsen their mood. So we are trying to also learn uh, how to make a personalized suggestion that is evidence-based for what you might do so that tomorrow night you can change your personal forecast. So you're not going to be stuck with a lousy forecast because uh, that would be a real downer. So with that, we're looking at um, a whole bunch of things. And like one of the things we're finding consistent is regularity of sleep is huge for most people. Uh, here's a person on the left with super regular sleep times and wake times circadian around the clock. There are 30 days each ring of the tree. And the person on the right is very irregular. Uh, Over the last century, depression okay, I'm going to end with rise. this very this two minute video and then I promise I'm done. Many college students. By 2020, one suicide will happen somewhere in the world every 20 seconds. By 2030, it will be the number one disease burden. Disability and lives lost from depression will be greater than from cancer, war, accidents, and stroke. The Snapshot Study is an NIH-funded collaborative research project between MIT Effective Computing Group and the Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital Division of Sleep and Circadian Disorders. Together, we study how daily behaviors and social connections influence sleep and health and outcomes such as mood, stress, and academic performance. We want to use what we learn to help build a system that automatically detects when an individual is becoming unhappy and help them before they become depressed. We have measured about 300 undergraduate students' health, behaviors, and other external factors like weather and location, and how they experience their own mood and well-being using a wearable sensor, smartphone, and surveys. Each participant was monitored for 30 days, resulting in over 7,000 days of data. We found out that individuals with behavioral patterns connected with self-reported high stress to have more irregular sleep are using their phones late at night, working long hours, and have negative social interactions. 
The self-reported calm participants in our study generally took breaks at noon and exercised in the evening. Through social network data we collected through calls, text messages, email, and surveys, we hope to find specific social patterns that distinguish between stressed and calm people, or good and poor sleepers. We aim to help predict how people feel and will feel in the future without them reporting anything. As this study continues, we are gaining better understanding about how to predict and improve a person's mood. Ultimately, we hope to prevent most depression from happening. That would make a happier future for people worldwide. All right, so taking quite a journey here from um, kids with autism. Oh dear, through microphones that fall off. There's stress. I'm sorry, that'll wake you up. Uh, sorry for the sensory stuff there, um, to uh, trying to measure things on the surface of the skin that we originally thought were just kind of generic stress-related, finding accidentally seizures that then showed us there was more patterned data in this information that relates to neurological sources of activation, uh, learning about SUDEP that has a pattern of brain deactivation externally, superactivation internally that shows up with even larger skin conductance response, and then learning about other uh, regions of the brain that now when we combine that their output on the skin with a lot of things you're doing with your smartphone and deep learning and lots of data, uh, we can start to not only recognize your current state, but we can start to forecast tomorrow night's state with much better than random accuracy. Now we want to work with experts like you to figure out you know, I don't want to give somebody a forecast that they can't do something about, right, if it's bad news. So we need to also, before we give that out, really understand what to recommend for people so we can help make their work together with you to help make their lives much better. Uh, so thank you so much. I'm happy to take a couple questions and hang out during the break, too. Thanks. Thanks.